velocity factor, end effect. Let's define those two terms and find out how it applies to wire antenna building. Okay, I'm sure you recognize the GMRS J pole. I'll throw the link to the video for that build up above here. But I'm going to use this to demonstrate velocity factor. And essentially, what velocity factor is, is different antenna materials and different insulators over those materials will affect the length of the antenna. And it does this by changing the speed at which the Electrons can flow through that medium, whether it be wire or aluminum tubing or whatever it is. So, in other words, a plain copper wire is going to have a different length than an insulated copper wire, and an insulated copper wire inside a piece of PVC tubing is going to have a different length than one that's out in free air. Does it matter? Is it a real thing? Well, I've got a nano VNA here, and all we're going to do is we're going to pop the cap off of this. I've got it set up here on this cardboard box to get it out away from the metal that's inside this ping pong table. And there's a couple push pins up here just to keep it from rolling around on my cardboard box. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to pull this out of its sheath and we're going to see if the resonant frequency of this antenna changes at all. And how much. So it's insulated 14 gauge wire, solid wire that has insulation on it and then it's inside of a PVC tube and let's see how much it changes when I just simply pull it out of its PVC tube. Right now this antenna is resonant at 462 I call it 463 megahertz and here we go I'm just gonna pull it out of its plastic PVC. Let's see what happens. And you can see that the tuned resonance of the antenna is going higher in frequency. So the resonance changed higher in frequency. The antenna became too short when I pulled it out of its PVC. Therefore, when I was designing this antenna, what I had to do, because it was going inside of PVC, is I had to make it a little bit shorter than it normally would have been in free air without PVC around it. So that's velocity factor. And the reason I say that it matters not when you're building a wire antenna is because if you just use the standard formula for figuring out the length of an antenna for bare copper wire, if it's insulated or if there's any other velocity factor that is applying to that antenna build, it's going to make that antenna too long and you're going to have to shorten it which is a good thing because you always want an antenna that's too long to start with and then just start trimming the ends of it until it, it falls into resonance at your desired operating frequency. So velocity factor really doesn't matter. You don't have to consider velocity factor when you're making an antenna. Okay, so much for velocity factor. Basically velocity factor is we, we, we take uh, a medium, let's say copper, and copper, bare copper would normally have a velocity factor of something around 98-99%. But if we put that in, in insulation, it's going to be a few percentage points less than that. So let's say 95%. And if you take 95% out of a calculated length, you're going to make it shorter. So for tuning purposes, just be aware that velocity factor will end up making your antenna shorter than what the formula indicates. In this case, when I say formula, what I'm talking about is the basic formula for antennas to figure out half a wavelength. You would take 468 and you would divide that by the operating frequency of your antenna. So let's use 40 meters as an example. And let's say we wanted the center of this antenna to be at 7.2 megahertz that our antenna in feet would be 65 feet long for a half a wavelength. Now, if you're doing a dipole, of course, you would 
split that in the middle and 30 something feet of it would be one leg and 30 something feet of it would be the other leg. But this gets you close. This does not take into account velocity factor. So if you use this formula and you're using insulated copper wire for your antenna, you will be, sh you will be long. You don't have to shorten it to get it into resonance, which is fine. That's what we want to be anyway. It's always better to be long and, and trim it to length than it would be to be short and have to add length to it to get it to resonate where we want it to resonate. Okay, so velocity factor, be aware of it, but it's not very important when you're building your own antennas. Now, end effect. End effect is a little bit more difficult because end effect is going to force you to make some choices. And those choices are going to be based on the radio that you're using and the type of antenna that you're building. So I always recommend that a new ham build a simple wire dipole, simple horizontal wire dipole, and I'll pull one of those up right now. A simple horizontal dipole is the easiest antenna to build, by far, and anybody can build one. This is what I have in the air right now. Exactly this antenna. In the center of it, it's at 28 feet, and the ends of it are at about 20 feet. This is what they call an inverted V center-fed dipole. And it's by far the easiest antenna to build. You don't need any fancy balance. You can just put a common mode choke at the feed point, run some coax to it, trim it the length, and you're working on frequency. So um, this antenna, when you, when you make this antenna, Almost certainly you're going to find that the calculated dimensions that you use with the formula 468 divided by frequency and uh, that's, a, that's a good number to memorize 468. I memorized that number very easily because I used to work on vintage Cadillacs. If you know what I'm talking about, put it in the comments below. But anyway, 468 divided by operating frequency gives you a half a wavelength. If you do that with a simple center fed dipole, you're going to be too long. And one of the reasons you're going to be too long is velocity factor, and the other reason you're going to be too long, or one of the several reasons you're going to be too long, is end effect. So let me pull up that other antenna real quick. Now this is the same antenna, the only difference is that I've, I've leveled the ends of it. So now it's what we call a flat top now, it's not an inverted V. And the only reason I did that is because when we plot this antenna, now you can see that it's a nice viewable current waveform. This is easy to view. And this is where end effect starts to, to come into play because with this antenna, wherever there is a high voltage point on this antenna, so the high voltage point is going to be opposite the high current point. So the center of this is actually a low voltage point. But when we get down towards the end of this antenna, the current starts to drop off and we see the ends of the antenna where there's zero current and that's our high voltage points on this antenna. We can see for this single half waveform current pattern we have two high voltage points. And the high voltage points of the antenna do something very interesting. They have an extreme amount of capacitance at the end of those antennas, at the end of any antenna, no matter what it is, the end of the antenna has capacitance. And the bigger diameter the conductor the more capacitance that you have. So if you're using aluminum tubing or something that's a, a big diameter like copper tubing on a J-pole for instance, end effect and capacitance play more of a role because it's a larger diameter and there's more capacitance at the end of that antenna. But in this case we're using 12 gauge wire and there's still a certain amount of capacitance at the end of that antenna and let me see if I can illustrate what's happening. So some of you may remember back in high school the uh, science experiment where you take a bar magnet and you take that bar magnet and you put a sheet of paper over top of it and then you take some cast iron filings and you drop on the paper and you just kind of tap the bottom of the paper. Pretty soon those iron filings will form a pattern on the, pen, on the paper and it looks something like this. And what you were seeing was the magnetic force that the bar magnet was putting off and the, the iron filings just oriented themselves in line with those magnetic forces. Well, 
magnetic forces coming out of a bar magnet and electromagnetic forces off of a, an, a resonant antenna perform similarly. So the scope of this antenna, let's say this is an antenna at half a wavelength resonant frequency, the scope of the antenna isn't here. The scope of the antenna is out there because these magnetic forces coming off the end of the antenna make the antenna appear larger than it really is. Okay, so electromagnetic forces off of an end, off the end of an antenna makes the antenna appear longer than it really is. The upshot of that is if we use our formula to figure out the length of a half-wave dipole because we have two ends they're going to make this antenna appear longer than it really is because we have two high voltage points here. So the actual ends of this antenna extend out into ether a little bit here on the, off the ends and make it appear longer than it really is. It's going to be too long by the formula 468 divided by operating frequency. So we'll use that formula, we'll throw it up in the air and we'll find that instead of being resonant at 7.2 megahertz, maybe it's resonant at 6.9 megahertz. No biggie, just start trimming it until we bring it up to 7.2 megahertz where we want it to be. So okay, now <clears throat> why is that a factor? Well, if you have a radio that does not have a tuner or you don't have a tuner and you want to run an antenna like an end-fed dipole or an off-center fed dipole, this is going to create an issue. So let me pull up an off-center fed dipole. So this is an 80 meter off-center fed dipole. And the nice thing about off-center fed antennas and end-fed antennas is they're resident on more than one band. So this antenna, this antenna could be used on 80 meters, 40 meters, 20 meters, and 10 meters. It's resonant on all the even harmonics above its fundamental frequency. So 3.5 megahertz, 7.2 megahertz, 14.3 megahertz, etc. But is it? So because of end effect, what ends up happening is when we run this antenna on 40 meters, instead of having one clear visible current pattern over the whole length of the antenna, now we have two. So here's a half wavelength pattern. Then we have another half wavelength pattern at 40 meters. And why does that matter? Well, remember I said that the ends of the antenna, where the high voltage points are, causes the antenna to appear to be longer than it, it really is. But we can see that two of our ends meet here in the center of the antenna. So there is no end effect on the middle of this antenna. There's end effect on the outside edges, but in the center, there is none. So the overall end effect at 40 meters on this 80 meter antenna is half what it would be at 80 meters. So it would be half of the length change on 40 meters as it would be on 80 meters. Another way to think of this is if you cut this antenna for 80 meters, it would be too short for 40 meters because at 80 meters we'd have to trim it quite a bit to get the length low enough or short enough to make it work and make it resonant but on 40 meters we wouldn't need that because we have two high voltage points that meet in the center there is no end effect here it wants to be a little longer this is even worse if we go up in frequency let's go up to 20 meters if we plot this at 20 meters now instead of two full half wavelength patterns, we see four. So there's four half wavelength patterns on this antenna. So in the middle where they meet here, and here, and here, there is no end effect. End effect isn't even a factor. There's end effect on the ends, but that's only one fourth of what it would be at 80 meters. So this antenna would want to be almost full length without the end effect trimming that we did at 80 meters. If we cut this antenna to be resonant at 80 meters, it would be way off at 40. But remember I said this thing would even work at, at 10 meters. Let's try it out at 10 meters. So we can see 
at 10 meters, now we have a whole bunch of half wave current waveforms. If we cut this antenna to be resonant at 80 meters, especially 80 meter voice, which is 3.8 to 4 megahertz, this thing at 10 meters, it would be up around 30 megahertz, 29 point something. So that's the issue with end effect. It, uh, it makes an antenna at its fundamental frequency be quite a bit shorter than what it would be at its even harmonic resonances. And if you have a radio that does not have a tuner, you won't be able to use this antenna on, on several bands like you would be able to if you had a radio that did have a tuner. So if, if you have a radio with an internal tuner, it's not such a big deal. You can, you can tune to those frequencies. More than likely, you can pick up the entire band. And there's other things that you can do. You can put capacitors or coils in the antenna to make it think it's longer at, uh, or make it think it's shorter at 80 or perhaps longer at 40 and make it resonant, more uh, easily resonant on the center of the portions of the bands that you want to operate on. But um, it's just something to be aware of. So if you have a radio that does not have a tuner built in or you don't have an antenna tuner, you probably don't want an off-center fed antenna and you probably don't want an end fed antenna. You probably want to cut a fan dipole for the bands that you want to operate on and tune each individual dipole so it's resonant where you want it to be. So that's why end effect matters. It, it requires you to make choices. If you haven't bought a radio yet and you want to use an off-center fed antenna, you're going to want to find a radio that has a built-in tuner. If you have your radio already and it doesn't have a tuner in it, then you're going to want to stay away from an off-center fed antenna and an in-fed antenna and go for something that's resonant on all the bands that you want to operate on. So that could be a vertical, it could be a fan dipole or some other antenna, but you get the gist of, gist of where I'm going here. So it forces you to make decisions about equipment purchases and which antenna that you want to run so that you can actually use the antenna. The interesting thing is I've had I've had two Yezus and both Yezus recommend 1.5 SWR or less at uh, full wattage, otherwise it will start rolling back the power. And uh, my very first antenna that I built was an off-center fed 40 meter dipole. And I could not use it with the first Yezu that I bought because there was no internal tuner in that radio. So I ended up switching and going to a fan dipole. And there was nothing wrong with the off-center fed antenna. It was a great antenna. I made several contacts on it, but I had to keep going out and adjusting the length in order to use it on different bands because, as I mentioned, if you tune it on 40 to be resonant right in the meat of the voice portion of the band, at 10 meters it's going to be resonant somewhere around 28.6 megahertz or 29, 29.6 megahertz, way, way high on frequency. And that's partly because of end effect that that happens. So just something to be aware of. Velocity factor isn't as much of a factor when you're building an antenna as end effect is. End effect is something you need to be aware of. End effect is something you need to plan for, and end effect is going to cause you to make purchase decisions about the equipment that you're going to run and the antenna that you're going to run. So there you go. That's part one of, of, of wire antenna building. I'm going to dive into some more detailed information in the next video. And uh, thanks for watching.